Dr. Haley is a research scientist and international lecturer with a PhD in biochemistry and chemistry. He is the former chairman of the Department of Chemistry at the University of Kentucky. He has numerous research studies published in peer-reviewed medical scientific journals. He has testified at the United States House of Representatives Committee on Government Reform and Oversight. He is a master of the academy and the chair of the IAMT Scientific Advisory Committee. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Boyd Haley. Uh, I, before I start, I'm supposed to make an announcement. Uh, I am the founder and, and uh, principal uh, owner, uh, stockholder in CTI Science, which makes uh, OSR, which is an antioxidant. And so I'm making that so when you hear my talk, uh, you won't hear a lot about OSR, maybe a little bit, but uh, I wanted you to know that uh, uh, I'm not being paid or am I offering any grant monies for this, to this group other than to say that I like you guys a lot. <clears throat> but what we're going to talk about today is going to be a bit different. Uh, <clears throat> the first part's constructive, and then we get into uh, some of the other issues ahead of time. But with the advent of the, you know, the flu season and the scare that's going around with the swine virus and things, I thought there were several things that we would want to talk about. Now keep in mind one thing, nothing. Nothing will deplete the body of the compound we're talking about primarily today, which is a natural compound. It's the compound that's at the highest concentration in your cells that contains a sulfur group that fights oxidative stress. That compound is called glutathione. If you take cells in culture or animals and treat them with mercury at any level, extremely low levels, the first thing that happens before any damage is noticed is that the glutathione levels, the reduced glutathione levels, drop dramatically and the oxidized glutathione levels go up. And so what we're also going to show you is that <clears throat> in, a, in what we call programmed cell death, or apoptosis, the way the body uses a signal to kill cells that they want to get rid of, <clears throat> like mammary cells of uh, a woman who's weaned, or a mammal that's weaned uh, their offspring, is that they oxidize the glutathione that turns off the electron transport system in the mitochondria. You don't make ATP, and that cell slowly dies and is digested in any way. That's called programmed cell death. It's a good thing. <clears throat> Those same cells, if they're affected with mercury, will elevate the oxidized glutathione, and you mimic you know, apoptosis, and the cells are dying when they shouldn't die. So here's what we're going to talk about, and this is glutathione and oxidative stress. Well, glutathione and oxidative stress, the simple way <clears throat> that we measure the fact that a person is not well or they're suffering from oxidative stress is we measure the level of this in their red cells. If it's a generalized oxidation, toxin, or infection, this level will drop, and especially the reduced form. And what we can say, the general nature of most toxicants and infections, primarily viral infections, is that they're most likely to occur in individuals who are already suffering from oxidative stress. In other words, People who die of the flu, if you hear, read the paper, they'll say they had an underlying medical problem. That could be they were sick or they were old. Old people lose the ability to make high levels of glutathione. The compounds, if you have a healthy person that's infected with, a, a, you know, exposed to either a very severe virus or a, a toxins, a, chemical toxins, the, the, they will induce oxidative stress, and in, in inducing oxidative stress, they call organs not to work right, and this will give you uh, the medical symptoms they expressed. And we can say that this is reduced or prevented by various mechanisms, which we're going to talk a little bit about, and if you can maintain the body's oxidative uh, redox level to a healthy level, you can prevent these diseases, from, not, you can't stop them from happening, but you can recover from them and you can reverse them over a period of time. The body has to have glutathione. And that's the nature of my talk today to start with. You know, how do you detect and evaluate the levels of oxidative stress? There's nothing better than measuring that's more effective that we have today. Understand, as a scientist, I know a lot better ways, but most of you aren't going to pay the $2,000 it takes to get that done. <clears throat> but you can get a blood glutathione test done, uh, and there are a lot of uh, companies that do that. And this will give you a hint of whether or not this person is suffering from oxidative stress. It's very common in people with rheumatoid arthritis, people with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, MS, ALS, autism, etc. that if you measure their glutathione levels, they will be less than half of what age match controls will have. So you can look at people, and most of our neurological diseases are in that category. 
The other good test that any doctor can order is the oxidized DNA bases or RNA bases. 8-hydroxyguanosine uh, is uh, remarkably produced and released into the urine in people who are suffering from oxidative stress or mercury toxicity or any kind of toxicity. And you can have this measured quite quickly. And if you want to know if the uh, treatment that you're using is having an effect on that patient, you measure this to start with, or the blood glutathione, or the urinary porphyrin profile. Uh, you know, and I, would, I want to preface this. These things work really good in test animals. You never know how good a company is at doing something and all the parameters that can change if you're putting something in a package and shipping it overseas to get it tested, or if you're storing it in your refrigerator for a period of time. You really have to confirm that the urinary porphyrin profile will work. I can tell you, you listened to Jim Woods last time, uh, I know his work, definitely you can tell whether or not a person is toxic with urinary porphyrin profile if you do it carefully enough. I don't know how good our companies are. There are several companies that do the urinary porphyrin profile and you could use that. And a urinary neoterin level uh, seems to be correlate very well with the mercury toxicity also because neoterin is produced from molybdoterin which heavy metals and other toxins will knock the molybdenum off, and then you see an increase in the neoterin in the urine, indicating that you're not able to take sulfite to sulfate, and sulfite is a toxic compound, and we'll talk more about that later. But there are, there are tests that one can do. I mean, this is not a pig in a poke. This is not magic or anything. You can do the science, and you can do the uh, measurement. Now, the oxidative stress it's the single biochemical abnormality found essentially all neurological, neurodegenerative, and neurobehavioral disease. And this is the, and it leads, is caused by the increase in the production of oxidative free radical compounds and which lead to low glutathione levels. And what we have to work with that, and I would tell you, you all know how to use Google. Go to Google, type in your favorite disease and oxidative stress, and you'll have papers jump up all over the place. Now, why this is important, and you have to understand that there are biochemical systems that we call, I call, primitive biochem systems. They're in every cell that ever existed. An example of a system that's not primitive is any system that's activated by a hormone. If hormones activate it, that's an advanced biochemical system only found in higher, higher organisms. But glycolysis, the ability to take a sugar and convert it to energy, is primitive. If you don't have that ability, a cell can't live. The second thing, to keep the enzymes active and alive, you have to have a highly reduced intracellular uh, system. In other words, inside a cell is highly reduced, outside a cell is highly oxidized. The air and everything we're breathing in this room is in a high state of oxidation. Inside, our body's fighting like blazes to keep our cells reduced so we can keep these enzymes active. So in the process of uh, when you become ill, you'll see that the level of glutathione drops. Now here are four publications, all done on autistic children, that indicate that these children, compared to neurotypical age match controls, have very low levels of glutathione relative. I mean, levels that would be dangerous. And now if you're going to treat somebody, and, you, and, you, and look, the, look, just giving an antioxidant, getting glutathione levels up is sometimes not enough. There's a place for good drugs, and there's a place for good nutrition. But you want to get the glutathione levels up, or you're never going to cure that person. I mean, they are going to constantly be sick. It is the hallmark of all of these illnesses, is that you have an oxidative stress, which is reflected by low glutathione. The main sources, we all breathe oxygen. If we don't have oxygen, we don't live. Yet, it is the final product of oxygen breathing through the electron transport system that becomes dysfunctional that releases into the body toxic compounds called hydroxy radicals or reactive oxygen species. We have a lot of terminology for them. And your body is constantly producing glutathione from the energy you eat from, uh, and the energy made through the electron transport system to scavenge the hydroxy radicals that are being released from your mitochondria because they leak and they're very reactive. If they get too high, they destroy the membrane lipids and your cells become permeable, they don't work right, and you become sick. So when we talk that one of the main sources of free radicals are damaged, toxic, or dysfunctional mitochondria. If you hit, uh, hit with radiation, radiation toxicity, it's not the radiation, that molecule, that shot came through, it's gone. They take you away from the source of radioactivity and you still die because you have destroyed the mitochondrial in, uh, uh, functionality, made it dysfunctional, and you're producing hydroxy radicals which lead to your death later, much after you've been removed from the radiation. 
And we can say glutathione, and we call it GSH, you read on It's the major compound of the cells that scavenge to protect the cell from free radical damage. It's there all the time. If this is low, you are suffering from oxidative stress. It can cause hair loss, cause wrinkling skin, causes aging, causes numerous illnesses. And you've got to follow that, and it's incredibly important that we address this, the issue of this compound. Now, there'll be a test on this before you can leave the room. <laughs> no, but really, I mean, you know, I don't expect you to understand or follow this, but this is just some of the chemistry, and it all comes out when you start with oxygen and you pick up electrons, and to deliver an electron to an oxygen species, you have to have a metal. Most of the metals, and most of this is done in the electron transport system, which is an iron sulfur center, has other metals in the body. If you have too many other metals that shouldn't be there, like mercury, iron, lead, cadmium, etc., you can produce these about anywhere in the body, but it's almost always the donation of an electron from a metal that causes us to produce this whole plethora of what we call reactive oxygen species. And the most dangerous of these is the hydroxy radical. It is the most damaging. It's the one that goes wherever it wants and tears up whatever it runs into. And it can start a chain reaction. In other words, one of these molecules can destroy hundreds of biologically important molecules through an, uh, what they call a chain reaction. And down here we have systems in here that are very important for the removal of ROSs because if we didn't remove them every day, all the time, we would run into a problem. We have superoxide dismutase, catalase, and peroxidized catalyzed reaction. Now, catalase gets rid of hydrogen peroxide that's put in the body. This sometimes is useful. And the peroxidized catalase system is where we have something, something like similar, like glutathione, that will take hydrogen peroxide and convert it to water. So we're doing this all the time. And sometimes we can't keep up. The more toxic we are, the older we are, the less uh, effective our diet. If you're short on cysteine, if you're short on essential metals such as molybdate, etc., you will end up not being able to perform this reaction. So we are fighting constantly to do this. And part of the time, is, you know, we lose a battle. We have 10 millimolar. Now, I want to tell everybody here about glutathione. Glutathione inside your cells is 4 to 10 times 10 to the minus third molar, or 4, milli, 4 to 10 millimolar. That's quite high. In your plasma, in your blood, it's around one micromolar, or one times 10 to the minus sixth molar. You know, over a thousand fold decrease in your plasma. Now, why is that? And so, for, uh, what I'm trying to get across, if you're trying to give glutathione IV, there's nothing wrong with that, and it can help. But it's like standing at the end of a waterfall with a cup, and grabbing the water and throwing it up in the waterfall, saying, well, we're going to shove it back up. It doesn't work that way. Because when glutathione gets into your cells, into your plasma, it goes to the liver, and there are receptors in there that bind the glutathione and push it into your feces through the biliary transport system. The reason that happens is if you take a, a swig of benzene, you have to get rid of that benzene. And that benzene is not going to leave your body as benzene. It has to be modified. It has to have something attached to it because it gets in your fat tissue and your hydrophobic tissue. Your body has an enzyme called glutathione S transferase, for example, that can take glutathione, which is water-soluble, attach it to the water insoluble organic such as benzene and then it kicks it out of the cell and it floats around the bloodstream and when that glutathione it's like a hand held up when it goes to the liver there are receptors in there that specifically bind it and kick it out so when you when you give someone glutathione IV what you're doing is you're just feeding glutathione to the liver because it's not going to get in the cells the liver is going to clear it much faster and that's the reason you see this 1,000 to 10,000 fold difference between the inside and the outside because it, it is the marker you put on toxic compounds to get rid of them. And you get rid of them through the liver. So, but there's other things that glutathione does. And for example, here's an active enzyme with an SH group. They almost all have active SH groups. Reactive oxygen species plus another uh, compound, that could be something like cysteine. And when you activate that, you can oxidize that, and this is called a disulfide linkage. And this enzyme is inhibited and inactive. You can't, it cannot perform its function. Now remember this SS bond. This is called a disulfide bond. I'm going to mention that later when we talk about viral coat proteins. It's the key thing that your body uses to get rid of viruses, is the formation of this disulfide linkage. Because GSH can go to this, active, this inactive enzyme over here like this. GSH binds to that, and it converts that enzyme back to its normal form, and you end up with GSSR, which is removed from the body 
or re reduced by an enzyme called glutathione reductase. But this is how we constantly are reactivating enzymes that are inhibited by reactive oxygen species. Glutathione also has a major effect on removing certain heavy metal toxins. Now, when you go to the health food store, you buy glutathione, it says an antioxidant. Glutathione is the most potent natural chelator that mammalian cells make. It is how we get rid of glutathione, if we're, I mean mercury, if we were a healthy person. And the process is like this. If you have an enzyme, you treat it to inorganic mercury, it becomes a mercury-inhibited enzyme, and it's inactive, and you've got a problem. If you have enough glutathione, it will interact with that enzyme. It will pull the mercury off, making a GSHG. This enzyme is reactivated. I've done this many times with compounds similar to glutathione. And then this glutathione here will react with another one, and you make this uh, bichelated uh, mercury atom, and this is the excreted form that goes out in your feces if you're healthy. And so that's the reason it's important to keep this up for certain heavy metal detox. So GS protects the body from oxidation up here and heavy metal toxicity. And this is why we have to uh, increase. But you have to understand, you cannot increase body glutathione levels by eating glutathione. It doesn't work that way. And this is the general chemistry of the compound. It's got one, uh, two, three charges on it in this particular form, and that means it's water soluble. The problem with glutathione, it is there to keep your body reduced. However, when we ro roamed the earth with our knuckles dragging the ground, we didn't breathe mercury vapor from dental amalgams, and we didn't inject organic mercury into our bodies. Those two molecules penetrate the, the hydrophobic or water insoluble areas, and that's where they react. Glutathione can't get there. It is it's water soluble and it just cannot get into hydrophilic areas. That's just common sense chemistry. In the oxidation process, this SH group forms this disulfide linkage like this, and it is the elevation of this molecule, the oxidized form, that we say we're calling it bad and good just to be simple minded and, and make a point. But if this goes up in cells, the cells die. And they don't have to go up very fast because it shuts off the electron transport system. Cell can't make energy, it dies, or it becomes very sick at the least. So here's the two things we're going to be talking about. GSH here and GSSG is this molecule here. It's not a uh, thing. So, so we have to talk about what is the importance of the glutathione levels. It serves as a frontline reducing agent, keeping all of our enzymes protected from oxidation. It serves as a natural chelator for excretion of many heavy metals, including lead, mercury, uh, cadmium, arsenic. It's attached to many water soluble and soluble toxicants by glutathione S transferase. This is an enzyme we call it GST, allowing them to become water soluble and excretable. And the, most of you know about Tylenol toxicity. More people die of Tylenol induced death in this country than any other medicine. And Tylenol kills the person by depleting the glutathione out of the level because people take massive doses of glutathione when they've already been drunk, they've already depleted their glutathione. When the glutathione levels drop down below a certain level, what happens? The GSSG goes up, the liver cells fall apart, and they die of liver failure. So this, uh, this molecule here is actually taking GSSG and depleting it by putting it onto Tylenol that someone has more or less overdosed on. GSSG can react with certain yeast fungal toxins like gliotoxin that's produced by candida. If you have enough glutathione, it will render that toxin non-toxic because it has a disulfide linkage that it inserts into, makes it water soluble, and you get the gliotoxin out of the body. Uh, it prevents viral infections by binding to the viral surface, preventing cell penetration. This is what I want to talk about today because this is something that's hardly ever mentioned. When you hear that there's going to be a major flu season, there's going to be tremendous flu problems coming in. We're going to have swine flu, avian flu, and uh, I don't know what you call the hybrid that we have now that's part human pig and uh, 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 chicken. I don't know what you want to call that, but there is one way. Your body fights this off. If you ever think, about how do we ever get over the flu? We don't have an antibiotic for it. How do you get over the flu? And we're going to try and explain that to you today because it will also, it won't prevent you from getting the flu, but it'll make it a lot less uh, tra traumatic on you. So the GS prevents the viral infections, and we're going to talk a lot about that. And this GSS conversion to GSSG controls apoptosis or normal cell death, but if it's not controlled, you're having 
un un uncontrolled uh, uh, death. Now, I'm going to go through some. These, these are available. I'll, I'll put them on the website, anything. It's, but this is all published research, and most of it's quite recent, and uh, you'll find that a lot of it's not done in the United States. But it's inhibition of influenza infection by glutathione. And what they did, glutathione inhibited the expression of viral matrix protein and inhibited virally induced caspase activation and fast upregulation, which you don't know about. But together, it says, this data suggests that the thiol antioxidant has an anti-influenza uh, activity in vitro and in vivo, oxidative stress or other conditions that deplete GSH, such as heavy metal toxicity, in the epithelium of the oral nasal and may therefore enhance the susceptibility to influenza infection. Now, let's, let's, let's do a Pee Wee Herman explanation of what they do. They take uh, cell culture plates, maybe seven of them, and they put the cells in that the virus will infect, whatever you want to test, HIV, influenza, whatever. And then you put zero, one, 10, 20, 50, 100 uh, uh, increased levels of glutathione in those plates going from left to right. And then you put the virus in, and then after a period of time, you come back and by you know, just standard uh, techniques, you can see which cells are infected by that virus. And you will reach a point with every virus that they've tested so far that I've been able to find that glutathione will absolutely prevent the virus from being able to penetrate that cell. And this is on the outside. Now, this is nice in a test tube, but see, you can't do it in the body. You put glutathione in the plasma, and it's cleared by the liver before you can breathe because it's primarily used to uh, uh, you know, deplete toxins and other things. So what we have to do is we have to work at getting the glutathione levels in the cell because a virus will go to a cell, it binds to the cell surface, injects the nucleic acid into the cell, and then you start making new viral products. But when you're making these new virals, entities, they're doing that in the presence of high levels of glutathione, if you're healthy, and the glutathione starts binding to the uh, coat proteins of that virus, rendering that virus susceptible to removal by the immune system, by the liver, and unable to penetrate the next cell because you have this glutathione interfering with the binding. That's basically what we're going to be talking about. But I don't want you just to believe everything I say. Here's one. Glutathione deficiency is associated with impaired survival in HIV disease. This is the AIDS disease. And it says this, argue, this data strongly argues that the unnecessary or excessive use of acetaminophen, alcohol, or other drugs known to deplete GSH should be avoided by HIV inhibited affected individuals. Well, don't you think we should say that acetaminophen or Tylenol should not be given to people that are susceptible to the influenza virus? But they'll tell you, oh, if you're going to get the flu, make sure you have enough acetaminophen around so you can really get sick. <laughs> and <clears throat> the, the molecular mechanism of decreased glutathione content in human immunodeficiency uh, deficiency virus type 1, uh, there's a compound that's produced by the HIV virus called TRAT, TAT. And when TAT goes in, TAT is a... Uh, uh, transactivator coded by HIV that is sufficient to cause glutathione depletion and, and, and is implicit in AIDS-associated Carposi's sarcoma and B-cell lymphoma. In other words, the virus has a trick. It produces a protein that pro makes your glutathione levels drop so it can survive. It's just sim it's simple, straightforward biochemistry. And it's not rocket science. It's kind of hard to do it, and you, know, you have to admire the people to come up there. So, uh, so it says, therefore, TAT appears to decrease GSH in vivo, at least partially through a modulation of the GS biosynthetic enzyme. So if you have something that inhibits enzymes that make GS, you're making yourself susceptible to other viral infections. What molecule or what atom that absolutely, totally inhibits glutathione synthetase. Mercury. So, but cadmium, uh, cadmium and lead does the same thing. On this next one, we talk about the, the restoration of blood total glutathione level with lymphocytes functioning by alpha lipoic acid supplementation in patients with HIV infection. We all know that alpha lipoic acid is a natural antioxidant. It's a constituent of the body. And it does seem to work. And it, it, it has a positive effect. But let's look at it. It says supplementation with alpha lipoic acid may positively impact patients with HIV and acquired immune deficiency syndrome by restoring total blood glutathione level and improving functional activity of lymphocytes to T-minogens. Okay, and it worked. It took the level from 1.3, I mean 1.81, 
up to 1.3. But it says there was no significant change in either HIV, RNA level, or CD4 count in this level of improvement. In other words, it did make a positive improvement on the glutathione level, but not very much. And why is that? Because lipoic acid is a natural compound that's consumed by the body. It's metabolized. If you're going to have a good antioxidant, you want something that's not being metabolized. And that's part of this uh, design that we're going to talk about later. But anyway, it does show that there is a positive effect and that you can, and that scientists think that glutathione levels, if we can raise them, should have <clears throat> a positive effect. On this one, we say increased erythrocyte glutathione peroxidase activity and serum tumor necrosis factor alpha in HIV-infected patients. Relation to ongoing prothrombic state. What we're talking about that is, you know, thrombosis, thrombophilic things which happen in HIV patients cause a lot of them to die. And part of that's caused by the low glutathione levels that are induced by the virus. And, you know, what these findings suggest, a relationship between erythrocyte oxidative stress and the hypercoagulable condition during HIV. HIV infection. So if your glutathione levels, blood glutathione levels are low, you have a lot of coagulation problems. And it's not just HIV positive people that have this problem. There are a lot of people that have coagulation problems. Uh, you're all looking at one right now, maybe. Okay, so uh, let's, let's just keep that in mind. And, and I'm sorry, I don't want to read all this to you, but I want to, I want to show you how, how much the proof is. The glutathione inhibits HIV replication by acting at late stages of the virus cycle. If you look at that, the data here is saying, if you raise your glutathione levels, you can decrease the replication of the HIV virus. Boy, don't we want to do that? We're spending billions of dollars on drugs. We know the natural system. We know glutathione is in the cell, can do it. And what we ought to be working on, instead of making a drug that costs somebody a lot of money, we ought to be working on good antioxidants that raise the glutathione level so that the body can naturally defend itself from HIV as it's wont to do. <clears throat> These results suggest a potential role of GSH in combination with other antivirals. They had to put this in. You, you make the drug companies happy in the treatment of virus-related uh, diseases. And the major uh, envelope glycoprotein, the protein that surrounds the outside of the virus, is rich in interchanged disulfide bonds. Remember I told you to remember where we talked about the SS bonds? <clears throat> to a chemist, that's an attack site. If you have an SS bond, and you can put in something like glutathione with an SH, it will do what we call a thio exchange reaction. It will go in and displace that, form a, a, a viral protein S to uh, glutathione. So you have a, a v, 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 SSG. And with that glutathione hanging on the outside, that viral coprotein is not functional. It, it's marked for removal by the immune system and the liver biliary transport system. And you get over the viral infection. And when it's there, it's like a blockade for that viral coprotein to bind to the outside of a, another cell and being able to inject its nucleic acid inside and infecting the next cell. It's a good way, it's the way you shut off a viral infection and the way you get over it. This one here, evidence for antiviral activity of glutathione, the in vitro inhibition of herp herpes simplex virus type 1 replication. I just want to show you that it worked for things other than HIV and everything else. And it says the intracellular endogenous GS levels dramatically decrease in the first 24 hours after viral absorption, starting immediately after the virus challenge. In other words, when the virus goes in, it, it has enough capacity that it depletes your glutathione levels. And, then, and at the end here, it says the data suggests that endogenous GSH inhibits the replication of uh, this herpes simplex virus 1 by interfering with the very late stages of the virus life cycle without affecting cellular metabolism. In other words, it has no side effects. So this is the way we ought to go. We need to determine. We don't want to put in things that inhibit you know, DNA replication, RNA replication. I mean, those, that's, 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 that's killing a, a snail with a sledgehammer. The relation between plasma glutathione levels and cardiovascular disease in a defined population, again done in Japan, not done in the United States like most of these are. And it says glutathione appears to have marked antioxidant activities and therefore may prevent cardiovascular disease, CVD. A lot of us in this room are worried about that, when, especially as we get older. And down here it says these findings suggest that reduced plasma total glutathione levels are a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, especially for cerebral small vessel disease. And so you really have to appreciate or begin to appreciate that if we can do something to raise glutathione levels, 
or prevent the reduction of glutathione levels, however you want to look at it, we could make a lot of people a lot healthier. This is called prevention and not necessarily uh, you know, a treatment or cure. And here, hepatitis C core protein inhibits mitochondrial electron transport and increases reactive oxygen species production. So here we have a virus that inhibits the mitochondria, and this is a picture that all of you ought to be smart enough to understand. The electron transport system is how we make ATP, how we make energy. If the virus wants to take over, it disrupts, and when it disrupts that, you start making RS reactive oxygen species, the glutathione drop and the virus has a nice home to replicate itself for the next two or three hours until it's fully matured and then it's released into the body to go affect another healthy cell and repeat that process over and over and if you don't have enough glutathione or enough treatment there to take care of that I mean you die and that's the reason that people that have quote underlying medical problems are more susceptible to viral death than anybody else they don't have the glutathione to fight this system off and it says these results suggest that interaction of core protein with mitochondria and subsequent oxidation of the glutathione pool and complex one inhibition may be an important cause for the oxidative stress seen in hepatitis C. And that would be the same with many other viruses also. So we have a set of conclusions if you followed, and I'm, I know you, that's, that's pretty heavy science and a lot of data to read, but you can say glutathione experiments indicate that GSH is important in both preventing and eliminating viral infections. It appears as if the SH group is paramount in disrupting the thio or the SS bonds of the viral coat protein, impending further replication and spread of the viral infection. It has been hypothesized that glutathione bound to viral proteins enhances immune response to these viral infections. In other words, it, it makes the immune system recognize that complex much more rapidly than just the virus that first gets in your body. And low GS levels seem to be a major risk factor for viral infections. And this is important with the current uh, concern about the swine flu. Now, most of you read the story about the students from New York City, evidently from well-off families that flew to Mexico, picked up the H1N1 or the swine flu infection, came back to New York City, and they all had minor bouts of the flu. Two days they were over it, and they said it wasn't that bad. And yet that's the same virus that in Mexico City, that the CDC and the World Health Organization says, it's killing people, we're going to have 90,000 deaths. What's the difference in Mexico City and New York? Or the people? And then I remember Jeff Clifford gave a talk one time, and I thought, that's a strange combination. He talked about the bioterrain. The kids from New York City are probably very well fed. They probably have, if they, if they get sick, they get the antibiotics on time. They probably have good glutathione levels. The poor person living in Mexico City out in the squalor, the first one that had it was a little boy off of this, you know, out of a squalor farm raising pigs. They don't have that glutathione level. They don't have the cysteine to make that glutathione. So they're low in glutathione, and that virus, which is relatively unaffected and not toxic or lethal to Americans, well-fed Americans that aren't sick, kills them. It, don't, it won't kill us. We, we really don't have that much to worry about if we work hard at making sure we're not toxic, we're not sick, and if you can find a way to keep them getting old, I'd do it. I mean, it's, I mean, but anyway, well, but I'm, I'm kind of making a humorous point, but I think you'll remember it then. You know, there, there are things that we can do to prevent these viruses from being this. And if our government spent as much time in improving, you know, compounds for oxidative stress and good food as they did helping the, vi the companies make vaccines, we would be a lot healthier. And, Thank you. Uh, do you agree? But taking anti antioxidants to develop body glutathione seems to be an important approach. And now uh, I just want to make two more points. This is the one on the acetaminophen induced uh, hepatotoxicity by N-acetylcysteine. You know, what they come down to, the, the only thing, the only way N-acetylcysteine helps is by increasing glutathione levels because if you take the L isomer, which can't be used to make glutathione, it doesn't work. I mean, if you take the D isomer, pardon me, if you take the, the L isomer works, the D isomer doesn't work. They're the same, except stereochemically, that one can be put into glutathione, one cannot. It's only the one that is incorporated into glutathione that causes glutathione levels to come up that causes any positive effect. So when you're taking these compounds, what you want to concentrate on is what you can do to either increase the body glutathione levels, either by new synthesis or by salvaging it. 
This is another one that I think a lot of people would probably be surprised. Dioxin causes a sustained oxidative response in the mouth, and this is protected by glutathione. Glutathione, you attach it to dioxin to get rid of it. But here, you know, if they gave a small amount, it's five micrograms of this uh, dioxin derivative per kilogram, you know, prolonged oxidative respress. The uh, hepatic oxidized glutathione levels increased two folds within one week, and these effects were uh, around for eight weeks despite no further dioxin treatment. In other words, you had oxidative stress that was permanently induced. The urinary levels of 8-hydroxyguanosine, this is the breakdown product, the oxidized product of DNA, remained elevated at about 20-fold eight weeks after the dioxin treatment and consisted uh, and, and uh, coexisted with chronic and potentially mutagenic DNA base damage. So some of the toxins we have, we really have to get rid of, and the only way we get rid of them is to attach them to glutathione. And some of them that are the most toxic are the ones that refuse to be excreted and hang around for a long period of time. Now, I'm going I'm to go over this pretty fast. This is some chemistry of lipid peroxidase, but a lot of medical doctors like this. This is the major place where oxidative stress shows up. It, draw, it destroys your plasma membrane. Your membrane integrity is destroyed because the lipids that make that membrane up, the unsaturated lipids, pick up a hydroxy uh, uh, group from a free radical, they're the best scavenger, and you end up with a compound like this, and it's an oxidized fatty acid or hydroperoxide, and this ends up in your urine, and you can get it. Glutathione can treat this, but it doesn't treat it all that well because you still end up with one of these with the hydroxyl group on the uh, unsaturated acid. Now, for some of the stuff that we develop, we know that if you look at Alzheimer's disease, it's usually the lipids that are most highly oxidized. So what we were trying to develop with the hydrophobic uh, approach is to get a product that would set in the lipid bilayer with the sulfur groups out because sulfur groups are more reactive with hydroxy radicals than our double bonded oxygens as you see in these unsaturated fatty acids. So you're trying to build a defensive barrier to prevent membrane damage by making a compound that sets in the membrane, isn't toxic, and has two big sulfur groups out like catcher's mitts to scavenge the hydroxy radicals that are leaking out of the mitochondria. This is part of the process that we're talking about. In this process, you don't make more glutathione, you just prevent the glutathione from being consumed by the overproduction of hydroxy radicals, and at the same time prevent the membrane from having toxic damage. And uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, that's, I, I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. Then, so what we can say that glutathione production seems to play a role in the protection against acetaminophen, Tylenol toxicity, even uh, uh, dioxin. Elevation of glutathione seems to be a major mode of protection by inacetyl treatment, cysteine treatment. Elevated GS seems to be important for, food, for protection of illness characterized by immunosuppression. And dioxin seems to elicit toxicity by depressing GSH production. That's the reason this compound is so bad. It prevents us from making more glutathione. So we're talking about apoptosis, and this is what I was telling you about. How do you kill a cell? How does Mother Nature kill a cell when it wants to? Because if you get yourself toxic and you get in the condition where you're doing the same thing Mother Nature is doing, you're, you're, do, you're creating apoptosis where apoptosis shouldn't occur. And if we look at this data, and we talk about the percent cell death, that's all this means, Opto apoptosis means cell death. And if you look at this, as the GSH levels drop, the cells die. As the GSSG levels go up, the cell death increases. So we tie that in and it's a signal. And what happens is that this GSSG goes and stops the electron transport. It stops your ability to make energy. It stops your ability to be able to use oxygen efficiently and so uh, if we do another plot, here's the plot of oxidized glutathione. It's sitting here at this level in the untreated cells that are living. As it goes up, it reaches this point, and at this point is where you start seeing the percent dead cells increasing. So this is the key that ties into it, and it doesn't have to go up that much, maybe 10%. So when you start oxidizing this molecule, it's telling the cells, you're going to die. We're going to prevent it, and it's what Mother Nature developed, and toxins take advantage of. This is how you turn off energy production, and the cells die from this. The DNA damage, if we talk about the 8-hydroxyguanosine and the increased ratio of this, as this ratio gets higher, or as the GSSG gets higher, you see more oxidized DNA, and this is what causes mutations and causes DNA not to work properly. So it all fits in hand-in-hand hand about how we need to take care of these things.
Uh, this is just showing that if you take GS, again, cells and culture. If, we could, if our plasma would not take out GSSH, you could give a lot of GSIV and it would work. But it clears your plasma so quick or your blood so quickly it's not effective. But if you can do it in culture, it'll take it you know, from here down to here, the, the percent of apoptosis will drop down here by just adding GSH to these cells that are dying. You can reverse apoptosis. So we can say there are several items that lead to abnormal oxidative stress or low reduced glutathione. And we can talk about toxicities, infections, inadequate diets, low cysteine, aging, and lack of warmth. If many of you ever think, why do we have viral infections in the wintertime? Why? Why? I mean, you know, the, the viruses like 70 degrees as well as they like zero degrees. But your body, when your body starts fighting to keep itself warm, you stop producing as much glutathione level. In Air Force studies where they've taken animals and put, drop the temperature that these animals are living in, their glutathione levels drop within, with decreasing temperature. And that, and that makes them more susceptible to viral infections. So we have to consider that. And I'm looking, I'm going to write a paper on that for you guys to read sometime. And so the concept, we need to directly treat oxidative stress by reducing the production of free radicals or scavenging them to salvage glutathione. Agonal oxidants diets, remove toxins, take out dental amalgams might be a good example. You know, increase the production of glutathione by providing pro-glutathione nutrients, for example, cysteine, and removing any toxicants. There's whey proteins that give you all the components you need to make glutathione. And you remove the heavy metals that prevent GSH synthesis by inhibiting the enzymes. So we have to focus in on several things. And, and I want to tell you, even though I'm going to be talking about how you can scavenge hydroxy radicals, the, the, the stuff that we're going to present will not replace a good diet, good supplementation, and in many cases, a good antibiotic or good drugs that will make the person healthy. It's this, there's no panacea, but we need to focus in on keeping the body, the terrain, as Jess, Jesse uh, would say, to keep it such that it's unfriendly for viruses to infect our bodies. So, so we, we came up uh, some time ago with this new antioxidant partition concept, and I learned this from Thimerosal. Thimerosal, when it breaks down, which this is the preservative put in vaccines, it releases a compound called ethyl mercury. Ethyl mercury is totally water insoluble. So it immediately goes into your fat tissue. Ends up primarily in your brain, because that's where the, the most uh, fatty tissue is. And so if you have glutathione, glutathione can't go there, it's charged. So you need something to make, we needed to have something that would go in and uh, uh, respond and fight oxidative stress inside the cells uh, and other places where, uh, you know, the organic and the inorganic, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, mercury could go. And the toxin-generated species, RSOs, in the body are located intracellular or in hydrophobic locations. So if we're going to stop them and scavenge them, we have to have something that can go across the cell membrane like a lot of the other compounds that we know about. The new antioxidants are needed that enter these intracellular areas. Selenium has two negative charges doesn't go very well into these places. DMPS, DMSA, vitamins. If you look at these things, they are all highly water charged. If they're water soluble, they're cleared by the kidney very quickly. They don't cross the blood brain barrier. All of these juices that you see that say, here's this juice that has a real high ability to scavenge hydroxy radicals or ORAC score, you have to ask the question because what we find is this conundrum. If it were true that the ones with the highest, the best ability to scavenge hydroxy radicals work the best, then the ones with high scores would always do the best job at reversing oxidative stress. And that doesn't happen. Sometimes a lower one, a compound or a food with a low ORAC score will be better at reversing oxidative stress than one with a very high. And so what it, is, it has to be able to get inside the cell or it can't work. It has to stay in the blood for a period of time. Or if you urinate it out, you know, half hour after you drink it, it's not doing you much good. So there are a whole bunch of parameters that have to be taken into. So we need to you know, you do an intelligent design of these compounds that can go in and scavenge these free radicals and get the glutathione levels back up. And so this is what we've done. We've uh, tried to make efficient antioxidants. They must be, have a good ORAC score. That's oxygen radical absorbance capacity. That's how well they absorb these oxygen radicals. And they have to be hydrophobic. If they're not hydrophobic, they're not going to do you any good. I don't care how well their ORAC score is. And you'll see a lot of juices that are at, you're asked to drink and they say, oh, they have this score in a test tube. They absorb hydroxy radicals. In your body, they don't. 
because you have to be able to get there, and they don't get there. This is some of the new hydrophobic antioxidant agents that uh, I've developed with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Naladra Gupta, who you can meet him at the CTI uh, website, I'm going to go talk to him. And what we noticed when we talked about this is that it had two large SH groups, which are free radical scavenging sites. The best thing made to scavenge a hydroxy radical is a thiol group. And uh, so we also know that this is water insoluble, so it would go into the lipid bilayers, and we've done a lot of tests to show that. But this is the compound that we've talked about. It's uh, OSR dose response for its ability to scavenge hydroxy radicals is linear with concentration. And the amazing thing is, and many of you have seen this, is that its ORAC score is over here at 192,000. And if you come over here to some of the things like people like dark chocolate, it's way down here. Some of these others, are, there's nothing that matches this for ability to react with hydroxy radicals except clove oil. And if many of you have tried to take clove oil, you realize how unpleasant that is. This compound as we talk about it, it it's, it's really good. And it prevents, the, you measure this by its ability to prevent the oxidation of trolox, which is a water-soluble vitamin E analog, by reactive oxygen species. So that means if you take this compound, it's going to prevent the oxidation of the vitamin E in your body, and the vitamin D, and the vitamin C, and a lot of other things. Because it's way over here, those compounds have absorbance capacities or reactive species down here. So if this is high enough, there's not a chance that you're going to oxidize essential vitamins in your body. We also know the whole rack. This is the hydrogen, the hydroxy radical. This compound is 299,000. I mean, it's even 100,000 higher than that. So this was, was amazing to us at how effective this compound is at reacting with hydroxy radicals. And so if you go through it, it's one of the most potent antioxidants ever tested. And it ranks up there with clove oil and essential oils. Uh, however, the OSR is without toxicity. We have given this to rats as high as five grams per kilogram. That's 3,000 times the level that you would ever ask a human to take without any toxic effects. We have been unable to find any severe, uh, any organ toxicity in rats given this at high levels for 28 straight days. It's, uh, and I've been taking it for three years this November, 200 milligrams a day on the average. The pharmacokinetic study shows that OSR peaks in the plasma and all organs tested, including the brain, two hours after ingestion. So once you take it, about 18% of it makes it into the body through the gastrointestinal tract, and it peaks at two hours, and it has a half-life after that peak of six to seven hours. 24 hours after you've taken it, it will be down to somewhere between four and 10% of the peak values, meaning while it does go up in your organs, your organs have a, you know, can get rid of it with, uh, with great efficiency if it wants, I mean, and needs to. So it goes in and goes out. It does not build up in your liver, your brain, your kidney, or anything. We've checked it, it doesn't happen. You get rid of it. If you didn't, I mean, in three years, I would weigh 300 pounds with all I've eaten if it stayed in my body. I mean, it just not, I haven't gained that much weight, okay. Uh, and we'd say that the hydrophobic nature of OSR allows it to penetrate cells and the blood-brain barrier where it can scavenge reactive oxygen species, helping salvage the glutathione and protect against free radical type damage. It does not provide any of the moieties needed to make glutathione. So if you're going to give OSR and you want to get your patients to have high glutathione levels, you've got to feed them properly, supplement them properly with cysteine and other molecules, other things like whey, etc. That would be the best picture. It will prevent the salvaging and the destruction of it. Uh, and does, so uh, this, is, this is stuff. And, and by the way, this wasn't done by me. I had to send this to the FDA. These were done by uh, commercial toxicology laboratories after we did it, so we knew we weren't wasting our money. We can't find an LD50 for this compound. Have you all heard of vitamin E toxicity? Go read the uh, MSDS sheet, the material safety data sheet on lipoic acid. These compounds are toxic. They're natural compounds. Someone says, oh, I wouldn't take that. That's something somebody made. It could be toxic. We, I want to take a natural compound. Some of the natural compounds are much, many, many times more toxic than OSR. So use your brain. The real key here is it not toxic, as no one found it. We've been selling it now for uh, about 15 months, and we don't have one severe report. A lot of people, and some of you out there said, when I took it, it made my stomach feel bad. I got a headache. I got diarrhea. You stop taking it, it goes away. And if you take it again, a lot of them said, I got it the first time and it goes away. I don't know if that's real or not, but nobody's been put in the hospital over this or had any severe things, especially if they stop. Uh, they, they, they're not mutagenic. 
by an FDA certified. These compounds are dietary antioxidants and not FDA approved to treat any illness or disease. I want you to know that I have, we, I mean, that's the law. You have to say that for any dietary ingredient. When you go buy glutathione, which we know binds mercury, lead, arsenic, and other toxins and takes it out of the body, do you ever see at the health food store where they say a powerful chelator? They can't say it. It's a dietary ingredient. You can't make any medical claims. We can't either. And hopefully later on things will change and we'll have more data to show from that. But here's some of the data. We did a, a human food safety study. Two medical doctors treating their own family and themselves. And this was people, there's three, one, two, three, four people here that were treated. And we picked them because they had low glutathione levels to start with. And if you look at this data, and I'll have to get over here a little bit, you see that this person started out with a GSH over GSSG ratio. So the higher that is, the higher the glutathione, good glutathione level. It went from 43 to 53 in the first month, and the second month it went up to 87. That's a big improvement. If you look at this one, he went from about 43 to 87. 24.8 to 64.5, 14.8 to 28. I mean, we saw major changes, and the major change wasn't so much in the total as it was in a reduction of the GSSG. That's the key. Get that oxidized glutathione level down, and the body will start behaving properly and, and help repair itself. This next one was done with older people. No, these, these are younger people also. It's, the others were older. If you look at that, we went from 40 to 87, 43 to 87, 24 to 64.5, 14.8 to 28. And the whole take home to the only major change in, in metabolites, we did over 200 blood tests and urine tests to see if we could find any toxic response to OSR. We were really trying to show that this compound did not cause your hormones to go levels to go crazy and what we saw and it was very surprising and as we kind of expected but we didn't really know is that it was very very potent at raising or raising the GSS levels and raising the total glutathione levels and it works in that regard and that that means it's not a pig in a poke any medical doctor or any dentist here that wants to see does your patient need are they suffering from oxidative stress you send off a blood test, it costs much less than $100, depending on where you go, and you can come back with a value and say, this is under oxidative stress. You treat them, and then at a period of time later, a month, two months later, you retest them, and you say, we're, we're correcting this problem. If you were causing the glutathione levels to go to normal, you have oxidative stress associated problems in that person, and it's something you can test. You can also the other test that I talked about, if, they, if, they, if you have a reliable source, uh, here's the one for seniors, by the way. These were people 72, 71, 73. This person went from, you see, see how low the levels are compared to the younger people? Went from 11 up to 48.8, from 17 to 28, from 15.8 up to 69 in these individuals. So this 72, 71, and 73-year-old, you can use this to effectively treat. Uh, am I losing? Oh, okay. Is this better? Okay. You can use this to effectively treat oxidative stress or low redox status in older people. I'm going to jump up. Remember we talked about the enzyme called glutathione S transferase that takes glutathione, attaches it to organic toxic molecules like PCB, pesticides, herbicides, and when you do that, you see that when we started with these people, we couldn't even, it was low, the activity of this enzyme. At the end of the first month, two of them showed a market increase. At the end of two months, every one of them showed an active increase in this enzyme that's absolutely needed for you to detox your body, especially things like the acetyl acetaminophen uh, or Tylenol uh, oxidation products. So in conclusion, we can say we have a non-toxic, lipid-soluble free radical scavenger has been developed and found to be without detectable toxicity. This antioxidant effectively scavenges hydroxy radicals. It's seen as effective in helping maintain a healthy glutathione level, and the healthy glutathione level is important for health. And I would point out one thing. You don't see this advertised. You don't see us bragging about it a lot. It will be the parents of 
ill children, and it will be the physicians that use this. We only sell this to dentists and physicians and medically licensed personnel. They will be the ones that will tell you whether this works. It won't come from Boyd Haley. And I think in the next year, we'll be finding some uh, very important uh, discoveries or uh, reports to show how well it does work. Okay. So now, how much time? I have 10 minutes? Yeah. We're going to talk about the autism epidemic because this infuriates the living daylights out of me. And you say, what caused the U.S. autism epidemic? First of all, this epidemic is based on data from the U.S. Department of Education and the United States military, where they have reported an increase, a dramatic thousands of percent increase in children that have to go through special remediation in school because they have neurological and attention deficit problems. That went up. It went up about 1990. It started climbing dramatically. And so whatever caused this had to be something that was introduced around the late 80s or the early 90s. And it had to be introduced in all 50 states at the same time. That means it went up in Hawaii, Alaska, California, Florida, Maine, Nebraska, and all the states in between. Now, the, I mean, I'm telling you, very foolish people in our government agency. This is the reason you know our government agencies aren't very damn smart. I mean, I learned when I was a kid taking animal husbandry in a little country school that genetics cannot cause an epidemic. If your cows are all dying in one day, it's not because you have bad genes. Something toxic hit them. They spent $28 million, the Autism Speaks organization, to identify the gene that causes autism when there couldn't be a gene that caused autism. Not the epidemic we've seen. So, when we, so if we look at that, we can say it's, it is not caused by genetics, and they proved that trying very hard to find the gene that they could blame so that they could say the vaccines weren't available. But what you did have is a genetic susceptibility to an environmental toxin. There are many of us that can drink a lot. We get rid of the alcohol and we're fine. There are some of us that can't drink a lot. We drink, we become alcoholics. And then you can have those in the same family. I mean, you can have an alcoholic and another person that's not, and they can be full siblings, brothers and sisters. There is genetic susceptibility and it's very refined. But what we had to do was we have to have that toxin, and it had to increase in all 50 states at the same time, approximately at this date. And the only thing I know that fits that was the mandated CDC vaccine policy, which started in 1988. The exposure had to be before age two. These children that are developing autism aren't taking drugs, they're not hanging out at the bar, and they're not going out where they might be breathing from smokestacks more than anybody else. Two years of age. Second thing, and this is the one that really kills them, the toxin has to affect boys much more than girls. There's a study where you take mixed gender rats and put them in a cage and you feed them the Marisol. All of the males will be dead before the first female even acts sick. It, and we've done studies where we showed that testosterone versus estrogen is the key ingredient. Testosterone will dramatically enhance the toxicity of the Marisol hundreds of folds time. Whereas estrogen can even be protective and will, will cause excretion of mercury from the central nervous system. So we know that that's the problem there. The thimerosal in the vaccine fits, the exposure time fits, and it, it has to explain, uh, in addition to these two, you see, it has to explain the, uh, the, the abnormal biochemistry observed clinically in autistic children. Let's talk about one. Autistic children are low in sulfate high in sulfite because they can't convert sulfite, which is toxic, to sulfate, which is readily excreted. They're low in molybdenum. Molybdenum is a cofactor that's held by two sulfur bonds on a molecule called molybdoterin that's displaced by mercury, lead, arsenic, and so other things, but definitely by mercury. And so you can see how mercury could go in, knock off the molybdenum, the sulfite levels would build up, the sulfite, sulfate levels would go down, and these children would develop problems. Children that die from seizures because they do not have enough molybdenum or cannot convert sulfite to sulfate die because the myelinization of the white matter in the central nervous system is dramatically reduced. And this is what you see in severe autistics. They do not have good myelinization of their white matter. And so this is all fitting. And the thing you say, well, what can cause that to go up? Plus, increase the neoterin levels in the urine is caused by mercury toxicity.
It ties right in. If you take people that have low neo, uh, high neoterrin levels in their urine and you treat them with chelators, the neoterrin levels will drop, indicating that mercury is playing a role in that breakdown and also in the removal of molybdenum. So we have several biochemical aspects that can only be explained by a pleotypic toxin. And by a pleotypic toxin, we mean a toxin that acts at multiple sites. The suppression of the immune system has nothing to do with the sulfite metabolism but it happens also. And so we have a lot of aberrant biochemistry, and I'd like to see somebody that claims that they know some science that supports the vaccine policy that says that this would not be, that mercury wouldn't be the most likely explanation. And now, just last, about a week and a half ago, a paper came out from UCLA that showed in 1999, 2% of American women had detectable inorganic mercury levels in their blood that indicated that they were retaining or were being exposed to mercury. They read this, it's called the NHANE study, the National Health and uh, uh, Nutritional uh, Examination Study. They repeated the data on people that were treated women, again, all on women, not on men yet, at that time, and in the 2005 to 2006 year process, that number went up to 30%. So we, in this country, are becoming very mercury toxic. He, this, this author, I don't know him at all, his name's Dan Lax, uh, but he is pointing out what we're seeing. And he also pointed out that the people that had the highest blood mercury levels were the ones that were associated with many, uh, with tests, biochemical tests, that show that the pituitary gland isn't working right, they're not releasing luteinizing hormone, their bilirubin is screwed up, and other aspects. The white cell count is dropping in these people that are more mercury toxic. You all know what white cells are good for. So we're seeing you know, a toxicity level, and our government is just flat ignoring it. And there's sometimes when you have to have the guts, and you have to stand up, you have to go to meetings, you have to be like one of these town hall uh, people. And you have to go there and tell these people, your legislator, you are allowing our federal agencies that are supposed to protect us, you're allowing them to keep us toxic and make us more and more toxic, and you are going to do something about it when most of us are so sick and ready to die that we can't do anything. This is, this, the research is totally against any use of mercury in medicine or dentistry. And yet we have an FDA that recommends that you put amalgam fillings in somebody who's getting uh, uh, you know, dialysis treatment, or young children, or people that are old that have low glutathione levels. It's ignorant. It's just absolutely, totally ignorant, and they get by with it, and you wonder why until you go meet them. They truly are ignorant. They're uneducated boobs. They're, they are bureaucrats. They, they've driven a scientist out a long time ago because no scientist would read what Bob Reeves and Jim Love has produced, what we sent to them beforehand, or what's in the literature. If you just go Google mercury toxicity, no sane person with any IQ or any capability or any training would look at that data and say, oh, it's great to put you know, a material in your mouth that's 50% mercury that leaves vapors every day. It's, it's, it's just it's fraudulent. Uh, and it's unacceptable, and I think, I think we have to go attack them, and I think we have to write to Obama. We probably need to start you know, a letter-writing campaign telling him, you are a disgrace. As president, you put somebody in charge of the FDA that says it's quite acceptable to continue using mercury-containing products and place them in our babies, in our elderly, in our sick parents who have to, happen to have kidney problems. Why, you, I mean, this, this is the height of incompetence. And I would be very happy. I wouldn't even have to show up. I would tell you, too, if you had a meeting of good scientists talking about mercury toxicity, I would be shoved off the stage with those that sit in the background because they don't have, somebody's not paying them to come and do it or they're forcing them. There's nobody with any credibility that's going to come up and say, oh, I think amalgams are great. The data is just too overwhelming. And you have to be, you have to be a crook to come up with the conclusion that the FDA came up with. I mean, you have to be totally fraudulent. And I don't mind anybody reporting and saying, writing to them and saying, Boyd Haley said you're fraudulent. They are. I mean, they're absolutely fraudulent. And, you know, somebody, you know, we all have to stand up sometime. And I think this is where we really need to go uh, to do that. <laughs> I... I <laughs> I would, I would just point out, there, there are two places where you can go and see this, and I thought this, oh, I need a mic, I'm, I'm done. I, uh,
just want to give a, you know, a, you know, a kick in here for Dave Kennedy, because Dave, David Kennedy, this isn't his, this is uh, uh, someone else, but he's got one on the ion cake this much, you know, that that's effectively shows this with a narrative that's just, uh, to me, mind-boggling. How in the hell can you look at this data, be the FDA, and say it's okay to put these in the human mouth? And you can see the mercury vapor coming off, and I would tell you that if it weren't a toxic level, you wouldn't be able to see it. I know about the absorbance characteristics of mercury. I mean, I do, I've done more uh, UV visible spectrotomy than probably anybody in the country. I know how it works. You can't see this unless it's a releasing toxin. This is a 50-year-old tooth, and we've measured it. As most of you know, the IMT did a thing. And the level that's exposed is much, much higher than what the ADA admits to. And that tells you they're a liar when they don't go and address the stuff that we publish saying, here's how much mercury comes off of an amalgam filling made out of the mouth in a cylindrical form, put into a test tube. That's the, that's the best test you can first do. They, have, they absolutely refuse to do that, and they absolutely refuse to recognize it. I mean, it's simple data. It's not any, it's not, this is not Nobel Prize winning stuff. These people are lying at the lowest level uh, that you can possibly lie. And, and I think, we, you, know, you know, you have to get mad. When it's that bad, when your government, you know, I mean, like, I, I think we have the best form of government in the world. It doesn't make it perfect. And the only way we make it better is to get mad when it's not working right. And it's not working right, folks. We've got to go do something.